in there last time in there. It'll do, but I forgot. Hello, Hello. <laughs> and welcome to the writer's journey. I am Kayleen Williams. With me today is the very only Lauren Moore and Papa Chuck Manley. Yay! And I'm going to read this little intro to you. Last time he was here, C. Stephen Manley, most affectionately known as Papa Chuck, showed us how to plot a story idea using his method. From genre and subgenre to the end, we plotted the skeletal structure for a whole book. Today, Papa Chuck's is Papa Chuck is back to work with us to take that plot and kick it into high gear. It's time to flesh out and develop our plot, Papa Chuck style, right here on the writer's journey. Yay! So that's what I'm supposed to be doing? Yes, that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> and welcome Unity 151 and TS Hoddle. Clappy, Clappies, thanks for being here. All right, so. Chuck's going to be sharing his screen because he was kind enough to start setting up in Plotter because that is the program we're going to use because there has been a lot of chatter on the Plotter. And we on even had plotter. a show mm -hmm. of, about Plotter. And I've been using Plotter and I quite like it um, because it makes handwriting so much easier because I don't have to handwrite and then like crumple up the entire paper because I wrote a word wrong. <laughs> 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 or I need extra space and need to add in a extra line you can just plop it in there with the plotter and I easily move things around which i enjoy mm -hmm. greatly yep, yep. yeah the All templates right. i find to be the most uh most useful thing as far as because like a uh, different story is going to have different plot formats and so on and so forth and they have a a pretty good library of templates there if you're writing action adventure versus romance versus whatever it kind of gives you a guideline to go by as far as what happens when so, and that's pretty much what I did um, after our last show. I went in and I made a template for a plotter that basically covers the brainstorming method that, that we talked about then. And I actually uploaded that to the ch uh, chat with you guys so y'all can put it in the show notes or something. But I, I exported it as a template that folks can download. And, you know, if they want to use it in their plotter, that's fine. If not, uh, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Do what you want. Do what you want. I don't care. So, yes, um, as a quick refresher while Chuck yes. gets his stuff going, we plotted a urban fantasy. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had um, a chick face who found out about werewolves. And then there was this like uh, cop guy that was also a janitor at her school. And then her mom was involved and her dad was missing and the cops were suspecting her. So that was kind of like the skeleton of our plot. Now we're going to actually start digging in and developing that into a more fleshed out story. Um, so that, because for me, like over the years, they're just like, Hey, here's this great technique for writing. And I'm like, I don't know how to apply that unless you actually show me how you apply that. And they're like, well, then you come up with the inciting incident and then you come up with this next incident. And I'm like, that tells me nothing. Please put that into an actual <laughs> thing. So that's what we're doing. We're doing a series on actually literally putting it into action. Uh, so for any of y'all out there who are like me, who are like plot the freaking story for me so I can see how you do it. That's what we're doing. Okay. So doing. on right. to full story development. So let me uh, figure out my, situation here do that share oh, we got more people dean floyd Corey gilliam um, josh hayes welcome welcome window i guess uh, oh shit wrong one sorry nope don't say uh that. hold up <laughs> <laughs> where is it where did i it put it like, there like it is all right so there's hang on God. it's not keystroke if we don't have technical difficulties that's the uh -huh. truth all right can you guys see that we see black Blackness of the board. black, <laughs> the black of the blackness. All right, let me try again. Oh, Streamyard is sharing. Mm. Stop sharing. While while he's Share. doing that, can you go to? Mm. Let's do this one. Yes. So my uncle showed up at like three o'clock in the morning last night, and he always brings me special gifts. Except his special gifts are nice and sharp and pointy. So this is my <laughs> this is my new beast. What and is that, that knife called, Kayleen? Honest, I haven't had time to look it up. I don't know yet. It's very knifey. It is. It is extremely knifey. Um, it's, it's made by wicked... mossy oak, mm. and I love this part serrated. 
Yeah, we could three to the edge on one side. That's my new choice. I'm sorry, guys. I'll be right with you. No, you're good. We talk. We can talk about all my knives. That's talk cool. about all your knives. <laughs> hey, Lee, aside from it. aside from torturing someone, what could you do with that knife? Like the serrated edge? Is that for like sawing a tree or something? Um. Well, you know, I've always thought when you jab it and you're mm-hmm. gonna pull it back out, it's gonna take a lot more with it. Because might be you go good for in, slaying werewolves. Yes. In, yeah, in survival this, situations, it's for sawing through wood. So this things. needs to be the knife that our character, like, I don't know. That, that definitely looks like a Buffy-esque yes. uh, dragon-killing knife. And it even comes with its own sheath that you can very handily attach to your belt. So, All right. I don't know why this isn't doing what I want it to do. I, let me, hold on, do that again. Never and... ending void of screens. All right, guys. I call Kayleen for my zombie apocalypse team. She can bring all her knives. <laughs> I will have all, all right. knives. I do. So we will I'm survive. just going to make this big. All right. Can you all see that? Yes, we can. We have all the right, I cannot. I cannot see you guys, but that'll be fine. All right. So first of all, uh, let's go through the, uh, the template I made. And uh, just to sort of refresh anybody that saw the last... Uh, last episode about this to sort of refresh what we were talking about. And uh, so essentially what I, this is just a method I've come up with over the years for whenever I want to plot out a book. Do you guys see genre, person, place, problem, all that stuff? Yep, we do. All right. So when I sit down to plan a book, these are the steps I go through to sort of uh, get myself a roadmap going for how I want to write. So the first thing I do is I pick a genre. Okay, and that's just, you know, adventure, urban fantasy, fantasy, whatever. And then I come up with a person, and this is usually the uh, the central character, the protagonist. Um, sometimes I have actually started stories and stuff with the antagonist, but I do need a character of some kind because that's, that's what readers are going to latch on to, to, uh, you know, follow through the story. That's their, that's their in. Okay, mm-hmm. so we I come up with a genre and then I come up with a person and then I come up with a place and the place of course is the setting that could be Narnia. That could be modern day Wichita. That could be, you know, the depths of, of Alpha Centauri or whatever, just a place for this person to be in and for the story to take place in and just decide what that is. And you do all of this in very broad terms. Like when I say I pick a genre, I say urban fantasy. And then I say person, I'll say 18 year old girl and named, you know, L and then in place, I'll put modern day Wichita, Kansas uh, with secret magical world and under problem again, very short one or two sentences describing it. In this case, the problem is her dad is missing and the police suspect her, her mother or her. Oh yeah. Her mom. uh, That was right. uh, Mm. Right. You see what I'm saying though? You just want to, you want to keep it very short and very sweet, and then you can build onto that later. But right now, you just have to kind of, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Kitty! Um, yes, Kitty. my daughter's cat. That's uh, His name's Rocky. He's so say hi. <laughs> he does, apparently. So uh, in this case, you come up with a problem. Person, <laughs> place, problem. The three Ps, as I like to call them. Dude, you got to get down. Come on. <laughs> All right. Um. Uh, then yeah. after I yeah no <laughs> then after I come up with those things I try to establish like what's a normal day for this kid for this character you know it could be showing up for work and bagging groceries it could be going into the CIA and getting the latest threat assessment it could be waking up and getting your kids off to school just what's a normal everyday day for this person in this place with this problem okay and Then once I've kind of figured that out, what their normal life is like, I come up with the inciting incident. And this is where the problem and the person intersect. So in the case of the story we were working on with Elle, she's having her average school day. You know, she's a senior in high school, one of the kind of nerdy, you know, bookish kind of kids, not like picked on and abused, but just, you know, not, not one of the, one of the popular kids either. And her inciting incident is she comes home and fire and the cops are there. And then she finds out her dad has gone missing under mysterious circumstances. 
Okay, that's the inciting bum, bum, incident. Bum. Right, that's where the problem and the person intersect. Then uh, we have the lock-in. And the lock-in is basically, this is where the character is kind of forced to deal with the problem. It's like, in the case of this story, we were talking about, well, the dad's missing, and we kind of decided that a little time might pass between the inciting incident and the lock-in. And at the lock-in, the the uh, L realizes that the cops have really kind of stopped looking, and they're just they're trying to figure out how the mom did it. And L's absolutely positive that the mom didn't do anything, so she takes it upon herself to start investigating outside the police to, to prove that something other than what they're saying her mom did actually happened. Hmm. Okay. So you kind of, you kind of decide at what point does this character, you know, to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be the one to solve this problem. And that could like, in this case, we said some time would pass between the two events. In some cases, like if you're writing a tough guy action adventure kind of book, you know, he gets called into his boss's office. That's the inciting incident. He gets assigned, go kill this dictator. And that's the lock-in. As soon as he gets the assignment, he's committed. And that could be a matter of minutes. You know, that could all happen in one chapter. It just depends on the kind of story that you're telling. Lots so, of flexibility there. Yes, lots of room to play. So after uh, that, we get into the pinch points. Now, pinch point one is you could also... I uh, forget what else they call these, but basically this is the first encounter with the bad guy or the bad guy's agents. And the point of this is you want to show what kind of odds are stacked against the protagonist. Okay. This is where you see the antagonist's cleverness, his power, his whatever. Um, it's where you kind of start going, holy crap, how's our hero going to handle uh, this bad guy. It just, it seems like the odds are against him. And, you know, you go through some scenes there. They, they, you know, again, this could be whole chapters. It could go quick. If you're writing a short story, it just depends. And then we figure out the midpoint. And this is kind of the point where the hero goes from just reacting to the antagonist to actually becoming proactive and saying, okay, I'm going to make a plan. This is my plan. And we're going to execute that plan to take care of this problem. And that leads to the second pinch point, which is basically where they enact the plan. And usually it goes to hell. Uh, <laughs> the second pinch point is where they try to, to work out their plan and something doesn't go their way. And holy crap, they get beat up, whatever. And it fails and it creates more complications for the, and, or for the protagonist. And they got to figure out what to do. This leads into what we call the black moment. And it's kind of their dark night of the soul. They're at their lowest point. They've just gotten their butts kicked in pinch point two. They're ready to give up, but something happens that kind of pushes them forward. Something, something unexpected or something that they hadn't noticed before. It just kind of, kind of makes them decide, you know what? The odds are against me, but I'm still, I'm still going to get in there and try and do this because this thing you know, I have to because of this thing. You know, I can't live with myself if I don't, whatever. It's like and a that, transformative moment. Like yeah, it's like a it's have. like a transformative moment. Great way to put it. So then we get into the showdown, and that's pretty self-explanatory. That's you know, Vader versus Luke on the you know, on the crumbling Death Star and, and all that stuff. So um, and then I always like to have what I call the new normal, which is sort of you know, it, it's just sort of a wrap up and, uh, and if you're gonna, you know, if it's a series, you might hint at what's going to happen in the next book, uh, that kind of thing. So that's basically like, and if I sit down, like for my next book that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up Jack Dark 2, I've done all this for Jack Dark 3. Hmm. It's, it's slightly different because of the nature of that book, but, um, but this is essentially my pre-planning process. And what you see here is typically all the um, pre-planning that I would do. And then I would just start writing because where you see the little blue lines between all these different points is where I do my kind of free writing. You know, it's like, I know the place, I know the problem, I know the person. 
So I just sit down and I say, and I start writing until I get to the inciting incident. And then I know what the inciting incident is going to be. So that's kind of my target. And I write till I hit that target. And then I keep writing whatever makes sense for the story until I hit the lock in and so on and so on and so on. So that's really about all I ever do. Um, now with Plotter though, and I, I'm probably going to turn this into a big commercial for Plotter. <laughs> I, that's okay. I actually uh, can do a little bit more. Um, that was just the template. That's what I, I said I put in the chat so you guys could download and anybody could save it as a template for their own use if they so choose. And that's something this, someone could like write out on a piece of paper or use Word doc or something they can do on their own without a program. Right, exactly. When I used to do it in notebooks all the time, I would each one of those points would be its own page. Mm. And at the top, I would write person. And then I would write, uh, you know, 18 year old high school girl named L. And then I would go to the next one, the next one, and I would just write one or two sentences at the top of the page. Then as I went back, I would flesh out yeah. on that page more and more details about the person until I felt like I was ready to start telling the story. And really, Plotters kind of duplicates that digitally, which is really nice. So here is what I came up with for the, uh, the thing we were doing. Um, Right here, you see, I picked the, 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 uh, you can see this, right? Yeah. yeah. Genre, okay. person, place, problem. Right. Fantasy. So we picked urban fantasy. We chose L. Winchester as the, um, person. Place is Wichita, Kansas, mainly disrupting the part is that her father's missing. Uh, normal day. L is a typical good high school student, senior, for a little on the shine, awkward side of the social fence, does the normal things that come with that. That's all I needed for to get started there. Uh, inciting incident. Come home one day, discover his fa father's gone missing under mysterious circumstances. Lock in, father's still missing. Cops convinced the mother's involved, so on and so forth. Uh, pinch point one. Now, during uh, during the lock-in, uh, Elle has a supernatural encounter, and she meets a reclusive school security officer. That is Officer Moon. Um <laughs> I don't know where we came up with that name, but, uh, <laughs> but pinch point one, they start digging deeper into the problem. They face a hungry werewolf, her first encounter with a, <clears throat> excuse me, an actual werewolf. She has to run for her life, but in the course of all this discovers her father's alive. The only thing that saves her is moon's intervention. And he tells her about the supernatural world. Uh, midpoint. Armed with the knowledge, Elle decides to take the fight to the monster holding her father. She convinces Moon to back her up and teach her what she needs to know. Elle and Moon go after father only to get ambushed by a pack of 13 or so werewolves. Big fight, both hurt and on the ropes when Elle's mom appears and orders the werewolves to stand down. For some reason unknown to Elle and Moon, they comply. Bloody and defeated, they retreat. And then Black Knight of the Soul. Now, this is as far as I got with it because as you can see here, uh... Um, plotter al allows you to fill in this stuff. Yeah. Okay. So if the black moment would be, um, let's say I can type in, uh, confronts mom discovers her connection to the wolves. And that dad was taken because of it. Uh, distraught by lies, etc. So on and so I don't want to just make, you know. I, um, <laughs> well, no, because we, yeah, we had said, you know, she starts to not trust her mom. because She's like, right, Dude. right. <laughs> so like a super secret. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'm not going to type out the whole thing. But uh, and then you see it, you just click save and it, it fills it in for you. Um, and then we go after that, they would come up, you know, they decide, uh, to go after the, um, go after the bad guys to try and save the dad. And I think we decided that in the showdown, the mom sacrifices herself and her new normal is going to be mom's dead. She knows about the supernatural world and dad is back home doing the single parent thing with her. Hmm. And then. The point, though, is that uh, once you've got this, 
like here's your timeline that tells you what all you need to pick and then you go to the outline and in the outline setting you can see you can fill in all the details that you need so you can like put this over here and have that in one window and um then you can have like over here you could have your uh your scrivener or word or whatever opened up and you've got your outline right there hmm. you know and from what i understand i haven't tried to do this myself yet but this will all export out to uh scrivener word stuff like that yeah and it yeah they they just had a um a webinar going through all the the, the stuff you might not know plotter can do the other day and it exports exactly as you see it so it has you know the section for your timeline and then exactly how you see it written here except with headings and everything for like word and then you know if you have like the whole character sheets it then has a section for all the character sheets and and all the places and all the things it's right cool. right so that's that's how i plan on using because i think i'm going to use this for everything going forward but that's pretty much it right there. If you go to the outline tab at the top, you can fill in all these different points. And if you get lost or if you need to change it or something, because look, these things are not set in stone. Just because you wrote out the black moment happens this way when you're outlining it and you get to the pinch point, second pinch point, actually writing it and realize that black moment's not going to work. Go in. That's what delete keys are for. Delete that crap. Mm -hmm. Come up with what will work, you know? Mostly I use these as, like I said, a roadmap, you know, these give me targets to shoot for because I think a lot of people when they hit what they call writer's block or something, it's because they don't know where they're going. You know, they don't know what the next big thing that's supposed to happen is. And if you try to figure that out in the beginning, then you can, you can record it here and it gives you it, it gives you a direction to write towards. And I think that helps a lot of people who find themselves kind of stalled out. Um, so, again, the templates out there, feel free to use it as you see fit. Uh, another great thing about the old plotter here, I've noticed I haven't really used this is you can make different notes, you know, like if you want, uh, you know, if you want to make a note about somebody's backstory or something that may not necessarily work into the story but helps you you can do that right here there's characters you can add characters we could do l we could do officer moon and it just gives you a place to store all this information because you do not want to try and keep all this crap in your head it's really uh, hard it's re especially if you're writing like epic fantasy or big space opera i mean my series aren't that big but i forget shit all the time Man, you know, when I was writing my first series, I kept everything in my head because I didn't have a plotter. And every time I was writing it on paper, I'd have to start over because it didn't look right because I'm weird like that. Right. And I had, it was like 58 characters memorized and their like allocations and how they're attached to the main character and all this stuff. So. Wow. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> yeah. And another thing is that... Um, you know, you got in the, I, I, by the way, uh, who the hell was that kid on that picture when we were announcing the show on Facebook? <laughs> what, what was that all about? He looked vaguely familiar. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> you talk some fly style. <laughs> that was about 1985, 80, I think it was 85. 85. But, <laughs> but anyway. What I was going to say is I noticed in the, uh, the announcement for the show that you guys referred to me as a, as a plotter and I'm not really a plotter. I'm, I'm kind of a hybrid. Um, and I think most people are, cause like I said, I like to have those points to write towards, mm. but really hardcore outline, like hardcore plotters, man, they will write pages and pages. They'll, they'll basically write the story before they write the story. <laughs> you know what I mean? They have everything detailed out. And that works for some people. I'm not, I, for me, the, I like plotter because I can just do as much detail as I want. And I still have those points to write towards out there. And I like the discovery writing that comes between them. Cause that, for me, that's the fun part. That's where, you know, like sometimes you start writing and you just, the characters kind of take over, which, mm -hmm. you know, not to get all woo woo 
you know, mystical about it, but you know, you basically, your imagination runs away with you and it just seems like you're not in control anymore. Right. And you can get a lot of really good stuff out of that. But I think if, in my experience, if you outline too hard and take that outline too religiously, uh, you might deprive yourself of that kind of creativity, you know, but again, that works really well for some people. I know that, um, uh, is Stephanie Plum that writes the, the bounty hunter chick books. I can't remember. Oh, um, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, she's like, she's like a very hardcore outliner and she's, you know, somebody asked her one time, you know, do you, do the characters ever tell you what to do? And she says, hell no, they work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you know, if that works for you. Great. But um, I think most people benefit mostly from having some hybrid version. Cause I do, I think people need to know where they're going to really get from once upon a time to the end. You know, that's just my personal opinion. And plotters are a great tool for that. Um, and I'm going to have a drink of water now. Talk amongst <laughs> yourselves. All right. Uh, with all of that, I'm going to take a quick like sideline. We don't really have a, a show uh, spotlight today. So I'm just going to say, you know, what? if you go into Amazon and you type in like a genre, look for the little gold Phoenix looking thing on the book covers. That's Athon Publishing. They write some really fantastic stuff. They're coming out with a lot of lit RPGs. They've got weird westerns. They've got your your space operas. They have your mech... Uh, I should know this because they're writing that genre. Military, sci-fi stuff. All the good things. Go check them out. Yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, they actually just... Uh, I, um... I think it's called the black badge series. It's a weird Western kind of thing. And, um, they did a novella, uh, around this character who basically he's a, he's a gunslinger who gets killed during a robbery, but the, Oh, what do they call it? Anyway, basically heaven grabs him and says, Hey, you're going to work for us now. And maybe ah. we, we won't send you to purgatory or wherever. <laughs> and, uh, and they wrote a novella and I was lucky enough to get to do a little uh, pre-reading on it before it actually came out. And it, it was really good. It was really good. And I, they, I don't know if it's out yet, but the first novel is either just dropped or is dropping very soon. I have no idea what it's called. I just know when it comes out, I will, I will be getting it. So if you like the weird Western stuff, uh, check out the Black Badge series by Athon. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. If I'm wrong, sorry, Rhett and Steve. I'm just, you know. <laughs> I don't know anything. All right. So we've got about half hour left. What? I, want... I talk too fast. <laughs> I want to go back to the beginning of our outline okay. and kind of start fleshing out this story. Because Do you want me to, you want me to pull it up again or. I mean, yeah. Sorry. I mean, if you, if, if you want to, otherwise they're just going to stare at our faces talking, you know, but okay. I guess that's what they do. Uh... Um, and mainly because. When we were doing the outline, you had to work very, very hard to keep, especially me <laughs> and Lauren, from diving too deep into the weeds, from getting too far into the possibility of what the story is. And you're like, no, we're just thinking of this thing. Stop it. Just thinking of this one right. thing. And so that was a really good exercise for me. And I really need like a tiny chuck so just like put it on my shoulder <laughs> and like yell at me when I'm getting too far, when I'm trying to first plot, because I, I do, I, I can get lost in the outline and then I just like screw it. And then I just start writing. And I just well, have, like, this I've, I've actually had a lot of people tell me that they, you know, in different writers groups and stuff over the years that, that uh, the reason they don't do outlines is because they do exactly that. And by the time they finish the outline, they feel like they've written the story and they've lost interest. You know, that, oh. <laughs> you know, some that's, that's how some people are wired. You know, some people that's, it's not an issue, but um, I have had people tell me that's why they refuse to do outlines because it kills the, the sense of discovery that they have wanting to tell that particular story. So, well, for, you know, for Kayleen and I, I think we get stuck at a point we can't figure out like how it's going to work and maybe we'll come up with a solution for the characters to get through. And we're like, it's just not good enough. So we'll bounce mm -hmm. some more ideas off each other and we're just not. Well, satisfied. what, what, Right. So 
For me, oh, I just get too lost in the details. I start like, oh, here's that connection and this connection. I'm like, oh, wait, but I'm supposed to be pushing it forward. And none of that's going to work for actually pushing it forward. Right. And then I get, and then I'm researching one tiny random thing. Right. And then I just keep rewriting the opening. It's, yeah, it's a process. All right. So I really want to, I really, at least, at least through like the first thing. Do you want, do you want to do the same? Do you want to, um, yeah, I want to use the story that we were developing. The so same, that, the same story. Okay. Yeah, so it's okay. like they know, like from from the idea to the core skeletal plot, and then now we're taking the skeletal plot and we're going to start developing the actual story that we've refrained ourselves from digging into. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to let you pick. I mean, y'all can see this, right? Mm -hmm. Huh? Okay. So uh, tell me what you want to, what do we want to flesh out? We want to flesh out the well, genre. You don't really, there's not a lot of fleshing there, but the person, the place, the problem, what? The normal day. I was struck by the fact that she's going to get help from Lieutenant Moon, who, you know, was in the forest, but now he's stepped back for whatever reason. And now he's working as a janitor and he's going to train her. That to me suggests there's something in her to train. So she's got some kind of skills, maybe an undeveloped power, or maybe it's just like she goes to the range with her dad and um, she, but she has, there's some kind of skill or talent, something in her that he could train to use. So, to so what is you, it? You, you, um, so would that be from like the lock in where something, well, I mean, that happens we could do and he sees it. Well, I think what Lauren's alluding to is she wants the she wants L to be some kind of chosen one. You know, she's got she's got some kind of power or something that that sets her apart and makes her more fit to is am I reading that right, Lauren? Yeah, I mean she could have realistic powers too. I mean they right. could be supernatural that she would be discovering in book one that, that would fit with the genre or the you know the So just something something subtle. But it could uh, be it could be like she's taken ta taekwondo her whole life, or like she likes to go hunting with her dad, so she's got you know range training. But there there's something there that Lieutenant Moon can work with, and can train her to fight werewolves. So the, so I guess looking at that main character again, what is it that she has? I mean, especially because I think I'm like, well, if Mom's able to control this pack of werewolves, there's some what kind if, of secret going on in the family. What if when uh. And, and I hope this isn't boring for everyone, uh, but, <laughs> but what if um, mom has the power and that's something that she finds out. And when she dies in the final conflict, that power gets passed to L. So what if, what if L's specialness is the fact that she comes from this bloodline? Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it only and then, awakens when the one who's holding it, Right, it, it gets passed from person to person as one one dies, another rises, kind of deal. Uh, to build on that, I think we talked about her mom in particular wanted to protect her from this right. other world and was trying to shield her and keep her in the dark. Yeah, um, perhaps because she doesn't want her to follow in the footsteps, or uh, she thinks this world is dangerous, like she's sheltering her from it. So, okay. so whatever she, whatever the girl has on her own to this point, it would have been something that her parents maybe aren't in agreement over, or maybe they are like, like what would her parents allow her to, to practice or to have? Hmm. Well, I mean, it could be as simple as just, she knows stuff, yeah. you know, because mm -hmm. I, because we mentioned she was bookish. Maybe she has a, a penchant for, you know, mythology and, and that kind of, yeah. you know, maybe she, she's all up into that. So she knows, a lot of the popular like lore and stuff about supernatural creatures and witchcraft. And, you know, maybe she's sort of a, a mini expert on the Salem witch trials and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe she's sort of naturally drawn to these esoteric topics and that, you know, which, which sort of suggests that it's in her blood, whether she likes it or not. Yeah. And then she finds out from mom during the black moment, the truth about her lineage. A history nerd, I dig it. So good, yeah. yeah. I mean, and like the mom could always be like, "Could you just like not? Yeah. Why? Are you yeah, keep why, why that? don't? Why, yeah, why aren't you on YouTube like normal kids? <laughs> you know? Go, go make a yeah. Go be a YouTuber and talk about <laughs> anything make, other than what you like. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, she loves horror movies and and you know. Oh my like god, that. she's my daughter. 
<laughs> my daughter, <laughs> side note, so my daughter just picked out a horror movie that she wanted to watch. And I'm like, I don't like horror stuff, but I, you know, I still want to enjoy things with her. And she's going right. down this creepy trail. Anyway, I had to be carted to buy this movie to be 17 or older. I'm like, wow. what the heck movie did you pick out? Wow. We haven't watched it yet. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a little nervous about this weird cemetery movie. A cemetery movie. Pet cemetery? <laughs> yeah, actually. Huh. <laughs> I haven't even yeah. opened it yet. That's a Stephen King classic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually. I don't know. Do you think it'll be okay for her to watch? I, well, I don't really know her, but uh, I haven't seen the new one. The older one was creepy, but not like grotesque, really. So I don't know. That's that's up to you, mom. <laughs> yeah. No, it'll probably be fine. Anyway, so side right, mind. so we've decided that she's kind of a history nerd with a uh, with a with an interest in the arcane and the, and the, you know, kind of not normal stuff that most people are interested in folklore, mythology, that kind of thing. How, wh what do you, what do you guys want me to do in the outline to, to help? Um, I mean, where do y'all think something like that should go? Should we, should we just create a character file yeah. for L? Okay. So we're going to, Oh, We're kind of just digging into like your process, like you know. But it sounds like you would probably maybe just like start writing. I, don't know. <laughs> I would. Well, honestly, uh, yeah. Like I would have finished out the 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 black moment and all that stuff. But um, but yeah, that's kind of what I do. Is I just you know once I've got just the bare bones of what I think I need, I start fleshing it out. Now I would if I was really writing this book. I would have these character files and I would usually have um, like this. I would, I would have a picture. I like to cast my stories, you know, and yeah. it could be an actress or a model or some, just some face I saw in a news clip or something. Uh, one of my, my uh, favorite uh, villains was a guy named um, Carmen uh, Screed in my uh, Paragons trilogy. And I, I got the idea for him from him, from this, this uh, courtroom photo. I saw this guy just covered out in tats and he had one eye that was solid black because he got stoned and tried to tattoo his eyeball and the ink. Yeah. The ink leaked into the sclera and everything and it turned his eyeball black, but he could still see just fine. And I wow. thought that that was such a striking image of this guy. That, uh, that I knew I had to do something with that in a story. And he actually ends up having one dead eye in the course of that series. So it's basically that guy that I saw in that picture. So I always like to have visual, you know, visual references that the, if I have a pictures for characters, they tend to, they tend to speak to me more. My Jack dark series I'm writing now, I'm using an image for, uh, from the, uh, the main, uh, the actor that's the lead in the new MacGyver series. You know, I just, I just like the way that guy looks and, and it kind of fits with what I uh, had in mind for him. So yeah, I would have all this done. And as I was writing, if I decided, oh, okay, well, she's, she's really into folklore and mythology. I would just shoot that into, um, into the, uh, the description, you know, and that's, and, and that would be it right there. Intro, it should be into, but you get my point, you know? These things would, as they jump out, I would actually use the discovery writing to flesh out the, the characters, characters as they sort of introduce themselves to me. Um, another trick I like to do with characters, let's do a new one. Um, this is going to be Officer Moon. Mm -hmm. What I like to, well, shit. as you can tell, I make a lot of typos, uh, <laughs> especially when there's a microphone between me and the keyboard. Right. So what I like to do a lot of times is um, I, if I'm, if I'm getting to know a character uh, and I want to kind of, kind of capture their voice, you know, for the story so I can, I can convey, you know, their characterization just through the way they say their dialogue and that sort of thing. I will actually sit down. And again, this is something plotters great for because it keeps everything in one file. But I will actually sit down and have them introduce themselves to me in their voice. 
So I would say something like, okay, this guy is officer moon and how would he, he's, you know, uh, cop ex cop with a tortured past. Okay. Probably so that's involving coyotes. Yes, probably involved. he's a were coyote. Um, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. Coyotes yeah. against werewolves. <laughs> so once I've got that that just that one line, this is this is kind of his archetype. I will let him talk to me. And I know that sounds kind of nuts, but I'll do something like this. Name's Moon. Scott Moon. <laughs> Used to carry a badge. Don't anymore. And the reason for that, none of your damn business. <laughs> coyotes. So <is> coyotes. <laughs> but you get the point, right? Right. I try, I try to dig in to my imagination and kind of just, you know, if this guy's got a tortured past, he's not real optimistic. He's, he's kind of rough around the edges and, you know, he doesn't like talking about himself. And so I try to carry that over into this little first person dialogue that he's telling me. And then if I get into the story and I sort of feel like I'm not getting him right, I can go back and read it. And, and it sort of refreshes my my feeling of how that guy should sound and, and who he is and that sort of thing. <laughs> I don't know why as you were doing that and just. I'm seeing him on the school grounds, right? And he's sweeping up trash or whatever he's doing. And he's smoking this cigarette. <laughs> right, exactly. That's right? exactly what like I'm talking about. Like, Moon, we've talked about this. And he just like yeah. gives him a stare. You know what? I do have a meeting. We're going to discuss this later. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. You know, and if you lose that during the writing and you can go back and hear that character talking to you, it'll sort of refresh that image. And when you go back to the actual story, it's in your head again and you can, and, and I find that's a better way to try and, and keep the uh, characters, you know, fresh in your mind. Yeah. It kind of keeps the words flowing. If you've got that voice in there. Right. And, and also I've been hearing authors tell me more and more that they write their book for a particular audiobook narrator. Say like Luke Daniels. Right. They've got his voice in their head and they they're shooting for like, I'd love to get Luke Daniels to read my book. But just the process of like when you're writing the book, thinking about, well, how does Luke Daniels talk? You know, he's got this kind of way of going. It might help you to have to keep the words flowing, to hear his voice in your head or or someone else, maybe in Hollywood or another. Right. Movie. Yeah. And I, I you know, I don't know that audio is getting so crazy these days. I mm -hmm. definitely think that writers should bear in mind that they're writing for audio because mm. I really think that's such a huge market and everything that um, if you're not writing in a way that's going to translate well, you at least need to be open to minor edits and changes that will make it translate well to audio. Cause that is such a huge market that, uh, you know, if you're not taking that into account, I think that's, that's a little short sighted. But uh, again, you know, and things like this is uh, the few times I've done audiobooks, the guy I worked with, um, you know, at one point he told me stuff like this is actually helpful for them too. Hmm. You know, because they, audiobook narrators, they don't really just read the book, they perform it. So things that help them get into the characters that you've written help them give a better performance, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, your little notes and things like that, uh, are, I think are very useful to, to, to guys who, uh, who read books or perform the books like that. So I anyway, say that's, a, that's definitely a good thing. Cause yeah, you become, you become the, the character as you read them anyway. So back to our story. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Well, so we've decided that her, her, her quote unquote, uh, specialness is that she's into folklore mythology and just seems to naturally gravitate towards the supernatural much to her mother's dismay. Mm -hmm. So that is something you could put into the character outline, you could um, like that could even be like an opening scene or something. She's just she's got yeah. a project for school and she decides she's in to the library. The, the librarian says, oh, what's this one about? Oh, why are you reading about, you know, chupacabras, you know, whatever. 
And, uh, and, and that, that's a good way to sort of, you know, you could work that into that normal day stuff. So there's all kinds of ways to, to do that. You just, you got to pick, pick where you want to put it, but, but to just, just to know the fact of that character, you can put it in the character sketch or wherever, wherever best works for you. That's the problem is that there really is no hard and fast rule for any of this. There's really no hard and fast rules for being a writer, except you got to put your ass in a chair and write. That's it. You know, writers write. That's really the only hard rule, in my opinion. Um, you know, everything else, you just kind of you, you take a little of what I do, if that works for you. Take a little of what Stephen King says to do. Take a little of what uh, Josh Hayes says to do. And you sort of put it all together and you find you find your own special little little puzzle pieces that that your own create. writing jutsu mm -hmm. created. yeah your own writing ju yes yes your kung fu is just as good as my kung fu that kind of thing you know so you know we could say yeah put it in the character sketch but lauren might say well no i like it better in this when you're figuring out who the person is i want all the character stuff there and if that works for you then that's what you do you know whatever's going to get you from once upon a time to the end that's the best way to do it all right, so we've got what everything you just said, and uh, Lauren's kind of looking at more this um, inciting incident or more the the pinch point. Do you think for when she really starts to get capture the essence of I need to be better, and so I can save my dad? Is this before or after she discovers her mom? This, um... Lauren. <laughs> Lauren. Uh, well, Lauren. I was trying to. Uh, I brought up the issue as a matter of figuring out who our character is. Oh, and then, okay. Yeah. So fleshing out the character herself because that might give us clues for other parts of the plot. Um, for example, like what Papa Chuck was saying with the opening scene. You know, she's she's researching something. Um, but uh, okay, so her her main strength is that she's a researcher and that she's yeah, got this she interest in in local mythology. Even though her mom, you know, is trying to keep keep her from that so she's gathering information um so she's already got like a nancy drew kind of personality mm -hmm. in that she likes to look for clues for history but yeah. now now her dad's missing and she's got a local mystery on her plate that's very personal right because the police are looking at her mom so now she's going to take some of those sleuthing skills that were for someone else some somewhere else and now she's going to use them in her own life um, so I guess we need to figure out, like, what does that look like with her dad missing? Like, how did she, what happened? How did she walk in to find that her dad's gone? Well, during the inciting incident, we have said she just basically comes home from school mm. and discovers that the police are there. Okay. Mom's there. Dad's missing. Maybe they found his car wrecked or something. You know, we never really got into the details of what actually happened to dad. Um, so, um, you know, we basically just have to find the, the sequence of events that bridges, uh, the inciting incident and the lock-in where she decides that she has to be the one to go and, and figure out what's going on. Cause they can, cause the cops are only looking at her mom. So there could be conversations with detectives, conversations with her mother, her having a lot of internal monol or monologues to put together the facts of the case to see, you know, the, the questions she's asking that they're ignoring, mm. you know, so there could be a couple through chapters in between these two points of, of her talking with other people, you know, maybe she notices that, uh, that officer moon is kind of looking at her differently at school. Cause he, he suspects something's up too, but he's obviously not just going to come right out and say, so, you know, sort of foreshadow. <laughs> yeah. Sort of foreshadow. Maybe she even suspects him of being the bad guy, you know, I and like sort that. of, and sort of foreshadow their team up later on. Um, you know, it's, but again, though, that's kind of for me, finding that sequence of events in the discovery writing is part of the fun. Yeah. You know, he's, he's trying hard to stay out of it. Right. Cause he 
left that light yeah, behind. Yeah, right. We, I mean, I haven't figured out, his, you know, we haven't figured yeah. out his entire backstory. But yes, he, like I said, he kind of, he just kind of wants to be left alone. He's had his whatever adventures, whatever you want to call them. And he, he's kind of like, look, I'm just going to show up, do my job, go home, drink my whiskey and be left alone. That's my life. And that's what I want, you know? And, and of course she has to come in and, and completely botch that whole system. Do we so need to figure it. out yet what the what's actually going on, or is that something we can kind of table for now and come back to? Well, uh, well, again, though, do you need to figure that out? <laughs> no, like I'm, I'm more. I in, don't necessarily do. But. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in the in the inciting incident. So, okay, like for me, my big question is, you know, why would she? even want to like start going after this mystery of finding her dad so it's like especially if like the cops are saying you know that they're, they're focused on the mom but things that the cops are saying is kind of scary i mean just to like start going out and you know discovering clues and stuff so you know are there things that are weirdly similar to stuff that she's researched you know, and like, does she start digging into like um, public record cop stuff or has she already been doing that? And there's things that the cops are ignoring. And that's what pushes her to be like, you know what? You guys have been ignoring this for like 50 years. Someone needs to dig more into this. And then that, at that that's... point, someone like is like, okay, you really need to stop researching this. So she gets a warning, which is how, where moon comes to her rescue because he's been like watching her doing all this research just because she's being doing this research dad's gone you know so it's like what's the tie-in for her to actually be attacked like you know what i mean well from my perspective you know the inciting incident is her discovering that dad's gone yep okay and then the lock-in is when she says she's sick of the cops just trying to pin it on her mom and she decides that she's going to investigate it and figure it out and all that. Now, the thing about there, maybe there's some history in this town that, that the cops have been ignoring that she wants to know why that's, that's all good stuff. You could use that if you wanted to, uh, as far as her motivation for investigation though, she doesn't, she wants to know what happened to her dad and she doesn't want her mom to go to jail for something she's sure she didn't do. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty simple motivation there. Um, but yeah, if she's already suspicious of the of the supernatural, then you know there could be maybe she thinks some cops are in on something hinky. You know, again though, I keep hearing you guys use the words, "Do we need to do this?" And have I? <laughs> yeah, you both you both have because I think you both have the mindset that there are rules. I have to do this before I can write. And maybe you do, but that's what you have to figure out what works for you. And if you need those details on paper, then write that down, scratch out what you don't like after you write it down, but you know, figure out how much you need to actually get started writing because like pretty much what I've got here, I, I could, I could start working on this in the morning and be off to the races. You know, that's, that's really all I need, but I, you know, I, I've written a lot of stuff, so I've, I've got a lot of practice and, you know, but if you guys need more, that's what you have to decide for yourselves. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm mostly you know, just trying to get the show focused on developing the story. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, <laughs> but, um, so like my whole thing, yeah, with the, with the inciting incident, I was, my whole thing was how do we go from that to the lock-in? Like what are what could we develop and how is that going to tie together? Okay. So that would essentially be like, you know, the next step developing from. Right. From one point to the next. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. all, yeah. I, all and I was saying. For me, what I'm thinking about need is I'm thinking of this plot, like this plot has two sides, kind of like if you're re weaving a rug, mm -hmm. right? There's the front side of the rug, but then there's the whole back side that she needs to discover what's actually going on. So right. the plot where we're at right now, we're only looking at one dimension of the plot, but there's a whole other backside to the plot that's happening 
that's going to interact with the part of the plot that's on our outline. Yeah, there's what's like right at. up front in her yeah. in her view, but then there's what's actually going on that she doesn't know Behind about. Behind the scenes. But you got to, well, but then the, then the question you have to ask yourself is, do we want the reader to discover it as she's discovering it and stay in her head the entire time? Or do we want to back off and do a little more omnipotent kind of thing and show what bad guys are up to? Which is you know, also a thing which, you should probably which direction, decide. Which direction do you want to go? Yeah. And that's something I kind of, I do that by the seat of my pants. You know, if I start writing and I'm in L's head and my instincts or whatever tell me, okay, I'm losing tension here. I need to show the reader something that else that's going on. I need to put another question in front of them. I might jump over to Officer Moon's point of view and show that he's watching her. Instead of ha just having her notice him, actually put it in his head and make the reader wonder, well, what's this guy up to? Right. You know, so it that that's that's really a personal choice on the writer. You so know? you've you've written thrillers. So I can ask I can ask you that question. You've written thriller, thrilling type stuff and you're writing from a first person perspective. Are you discovering what's going on behind the scenes as sometimes? Okay. Or Some, sometimes like in my Jack dark series, it's all first person. Mm. So the reader doesn't know anything. Jack doesn't know. Okay. In my brace Cordova books, I combined first person and third person. So the first person stuff, everybody sees what, what brace sees, but then I would jump over to like his sister or somebody, some other, not his sister, his cousin, or some other character, I'd write that in third person to show events that are happening outside of Brace's point of view so that the reader knows, oh, Brace is going this way and this thing's coming this way, but he doesn't know it. And they're going to, you know, they're going to run into each other. And that adds tension for the reader because they like Brace and they don't want him to get blown up. But they know this thing is coming that could blow him up that he is completely unaware of. So that makes the reader a little anxious, you yeah. know, like, oh, crap, when's this going to happen? You know, that but kind of thing. That's the order at which you're presenting the information to the to the reader. My question is, when do you as the writer know the backstory? Do you have it like figured out? before? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, <sighs> I mean, I hate it, it depends, <laughs> you know, like I said, I've got, I've got all those points that yeah. I talked about, you know, I know that this event has to happen to move to this event, to this event, to this event. But like I said, with the discovery writing, it, it's kind of the in-betweens are where things like that come out. Now, sometimes I'll know right up front, like with, with Jack Dark, I I've known from the beginning pretty much at least two thirds of that entire story, which is way, way, way more than Jack knows at the point I'm at right now with book two. Um, uh, so it, you know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't mm. uh, like, like right now with this thing with L I'm not entirely sure what happened to dad and what's up with the werewolves, but I know that mom has to know about it. Officer moon has to know about it. And there has to be some way for him to survive it, for dad to survive it in order to be at, the, you know, I, I know that I want those things to happen. And with that framework, I'll figure out a way what, you know, if there's a ritual that they're going to use him for or some nonsense like that, whatever. But all of that will kind of come out organically for me. That, again, that's the way I do it. I'm not saying everybody has to do it that way. But uh, sometimes I know what's going on. Sometimes I'm guessing. And sometimes I think I know. And then halfway through, I go, holy crap, that's not going to work. I have to do it this way. You know, so that's why I say you don't want to get too locked into your plans because mm -hmm. sometimes plans change and you got to be ready to roll with that. Yeah, and again, we'll plotter's great for all of this, in my opinion. So, yeah, we'll say don't spend three months on like a whole series of things and you're trying and trying and trying to make it work only just to delete the 30,000 words that you were working on and exchange it for a, you know, a hundred word. My advice, dialogue. My advice <laughs> for most people is just sit down and write beginning to end. It might be, it probably will be utter crap 
from beginning to end. But the beautiful thing is you can polish that crap and you can cut and add and change. But if you have a complete manuscript to work with, a beginning, a middle and an end, and you need to change something in the middle, but you like the end, you know where that middle's going now. Right. Okay. You know where it ends up. So you can go and cut the, you know, find the crystals in the crap and make it, make it nice. You cannot edit a blank page. Hmm. So finish your first draft. Don't worry if you screw it up. Don't worry about typos. Don't worry about plot holes. Don't worry about crappy characters. Don't worry about anything. Get from one to the end and then go back and worry about all that crap. Because you never know what you're going to discover on the course of that journey. You know, you may think halfway through, oh, this guy is just, this guy is the worst. He's not a good character. I need to stop writing and go and change him and cut him and blah, blah, blah. But if you finish it without worrying about that and go all the way to the end, holy crap, he could end up being the whole savior of the whole story. You don't know hmm. until you finish it. You, I, I think there's a certain level of, you have to be relaxed enough to give yourself over to the creativity and not worry so much about being in control. Again, strictly my opinion, but it's just, you know, sometimes you can be just a little too worried about it, mm. you know, or, or worried what people will think when they read it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think it's just, you gotta, you gotta let go of all that. You gotta let go of insecurity and you gotta let go of, of control issues and just sit down and write it. Mm -hmm. And, and cause nobody's going to see it, but you, and maybe your editor, <laughs> you know, so who cares how bad it is? I have put stuff in manuscripts. Like I've been writing along and I will, I'll get, I'll, I'll be looking at what I'm writing and I will actually, I've actually typed into the, the actual text of the thing. Chuck, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you know, and, but I just kept going because I'll figure that out later. And that's a great, uh, like do that in all caps. So you know where the problem spots are. That's a, that's a good way to do that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I will it's, say it's I, hard to tell folks how they should do this because everybody's <laughs> no, going to do it their no, own we're way. Just, we're giving examples. And I want to say, I yeah. do one of the very like the top three things I learned all those years ago when I was actually purposefully writing to publish was when I was first writing is to not care what my sentences sound like. Right. Because that was the hardest thing when I wrote my very first book that no one has ever seen <laughs> <laughs> um, was every sentence was excruciating. I mean, it took me 10 years to write chapter one because it never sounded right. Yeah. You know, but I never got to the end, so I never knew how to open it. And yeah, so you know, what I, I when I started doing um, KDP, I uh, I remember I was thinking, you know, because I was always writing something anyway. But I was kind of like, oh, I'll put it out there, see how folks react. You know, I wasn't, you know, planning on making a bajillion dollars or anything like that. But I remember thinking to myself, and I think I read this somewhere. I don't know, but um, I said, yeah. You know, some folks are going to like what I do. Some folks aren't going to like what I do. But the vast majority of people just will not give a shit. Mm. And that's the truth. That is the honest truth. You know, I mean, the some people, you know, you look at your people's reviews. Some people give it a five star. Some people give it a one star. But you look at the number of people that have reviewed it and then you compare that to the population of readers in the world. The vast majority do not care. So write what you want. You know, yeah. it's like just just relax. We're not curing cancer here. We're telling stories. It's, you know, just just write the story. And if you're happy with it and it's the best work you think you can do, put it out there and work on something new. You know, no stress. That's my opinion. And. I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, thank All you, right. Papa Chuck. This yeah. this actually encourages me. You know, we've got a, a start, and that's all we need to get going. But the main thing is the discipline to actually do it. <laughs> yeah, and and have fun. That's you know that's yeah, another thing. Fun. Just this is this is really imaginative play. Just mm -hmm. have have because you can always go back and and edit and change and you know it's it's good My stuff. My takeaway is is really sticking to just getting that skeletal plot 
and then as you were saying have the character talk to you that just sounds like this just sounds like a lot of fun so then it's like all yeah. these characters that were popping up in my head i can start just playing with them and talking to them and yeah the then best the best ones start, are the villains yeah <laughs> and then sit down, there, and have, sit down and have your bad guy justify their actions to you i did that with a serial killer one, character one time i was i was playing around with writing like a cop thing and i think i did like a short novella or whatever but I, I sat down and i said all right this guy is a psychopath he murders people for whatever reason and i had him talk to me like and explain to me why he does the horrible horrible things that he did <laughs> you know that can be a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> all right so for everyone out there you got your skeletal plot line outline Either jump in and start writing, start from the end, start from the middle, start from the beginning, discover your characters more, discover your world more, find photos that um, resonate with characters that you have in mind, and just get your butt in the chair and start writing, however that may be. Alrighty. Thank you so much, Papa Chuck, for joining us. And Happy to come on anytime. Bringing more of your world into our world. We love you. We love you, audience. And we know we've been missing a few shows, but that's okay. We're all crazy and life is life is a whirlwind and it's going to be okay. All right. For Laura Moore, I'm Kayleen Williams. Be sure to check us out next week. Hit that subscribe button. Ding the little bell. Hit the like. Find us on all the Podbean, Apple things, whatnot, meums. And we'll see you next week, hopefully, for more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium.